Hello, Isabella from Pride Tire here, and today we are looking at, guess what, yet another 1890s dress. Uh, but the, I know we've done a few, but there are so many different styles and so much is happening in the fashion at that time that it's worth to make just one more. And today we are looking at a Parisian visiting gown, afternoon visiting gown, which is quite unusual because it's very reminiscent of the aesthetic gowns. Aesthetic gowns were usually loose fitted, uh, with flowing elements, very much historical or orientally sort of inspired. And this one really sort of bridges the gap between the um, traditional 1890s and the aesthetics um, that was just coming to fall. Um, and we'll have a look what's underneath. Um, and what is really changing in that time, as we're looking at the second half of, um, of 90, 1890s, is the corsetry. Um, the, what we traditionally think of as Victorian styles, the hourglass um, silhouette, with nicely silhou silhouetted bust, hips, and a little bit of Victorian belly, is changing a lot in 1890s, mostly because the dresses have more or less flat front. So whether your little Victorian belly was absolutely fine with apron draped front dresses, here we are starting to see the beginning of the Edwardian silhouette, which is the what we nowadays call an S-bend, or sort of flat front corset, which is basically holding tummy in, but it's out really, <laughs> just with a nice kept back. So this style of corsets with gauze specifically designed to flatter this kind of shape or create this kind of illusion, because it was an illusion, um, is just starting to come into the fashion. And you can see them in catalogues in 1897. Gauze per se are obviously present all the time, different styles. But that sort of flattening of the belly sort of starts happening at the time. So that's what we have. It's um, basically very much found a circular corset shape. And this one is a pattern from Silk Curving called Camille. And at the same time, what I said about the waist is hips could be padded. Uh, quite a lot of my original padding, I think. But you really rely on hip padding, bum padding and bust padding as well. Sorry, there was an interruption by a friend. Um, so we can rely on the padding like these, or padding like these for a little bit of oomph at the rear area. So it's really what you prefer. I might go for a little bit of that. So we'll we'll see. So that's where the illusion really comes from. It's the corset is really quite big at the bust and it starts creeping down a little bit more. So it's always been mid bust, um, with the exception of sort of straps, strapped corset and sports corset. But it slowly starts creeping down and we will see that much more in the late next century. What's also starting to happen is, as you can see at the moment, I have my stockings and garters and the little, little drawers. They are still split drawers, but we gradually see. Oh, that's not my drawers. Mm. I don't have drawers. I've lost my knickers. Mm. Ah. I don't know where my knickers are. Oh, there you go. Found my knickers. Mm. What we also see is knickers with a rear flap. They're, they're absolutely tiny, but you can see they were buttoned at the back of the waistband and the flap was buttoned up at the back. A bit tricky to take off, so they're not... Ta-da! Definitely not my size though. That's waist back. Must, must have been for a teenager. So that's another style that is just coming into, into fashion. And what changes um, at the very beginning of the 20th century, really, is how you attach your stockings. 
I have another corset of the same here. This one already has suspenders on. So you have suspenders being used attached to a corset and obviously that's how you attach and keep your stockings on. No need for garters, no need for additional pressure around your thighs. So that was a very useful um, system that survives up today. We see first sort of garter or sort of little girdle belts coming up at that time as well, a separate contraption around the waist with the suspenders here. Um, so that's something that I've seen once or twice, I think. I'm not sure exactly whether they were lingerie or whether they're just skirt lifters for the skirt for support. I'm not sure. It's still ongoing research. But that way, of course, it's going lower down and obviously with straight front, the suspenders look quite nice and they and they, uh, get the attention sorted. I'll put a couple of photos here of other, of other styles. And very gradually, of course, it really sort of lowers down, lowers down till in the 1920s, it's just the girdle. So that's a little bit of a history of a corset. But since we're going for a nice walk, you know, a little aesthetic dress, let's carry on. Now this corset is 24 inches waist, it's not closed shut but close. My inch is about 31 inches. So it really sculptures all the blubber around and pushes down, that's where the hip comes from. <laughs> Natural padding. Right. Let's start with the petticoats first. And again, a nice original petticoat, double flounces. It's a little bit too big, but there's a handy string. To create a little bit more volume, let's resort to our trusty petticoats we've already seen in cotton with loads of silk ruffles. That's my favourite petticoat. So much drama, so much shape and nice colours as well. Let me just do the button up. Depending on the day, a corset cover might come handy, but it's yes, no, yes, no. Nah, let's get on with stuff. So, the first part of the dress is basically a blouse, cotton with some lace, and long sleeves in silk velvet. It has an interesting colour, looking like a mouse, and it closes at the back. The lace has been applied over the velvet as well, creating quite a nice detail. And makes it a little bit stiffer, which is a godsend, because silk velvet is an interesting fabric to handle. Let us put it this way. And at this point, I need help. Husband? So, the bodice is on. As you can see, it is a little bit fluffy, it's gathered here. It could also be just left loose and put inside the skirt, but to avoid that extra bulk at the waist and to create a small waist illusion, it's just kept to absolute minimum. It's buttoned at the back and the collar is quite tight. Right, skirt. Again, full silk velvet with lace application and some fur trim. And as always in the 1890s, a nice full flounce at the bottom. Let's dive in. Um, 
the waist is quite wide and it's stiffened with boning as well. So let's see how that works. The hair is in, the ears are in. I'm in. Right, let me find the beginning and the end. That's how it is, and I need my husband's help to close it at the back. Coming, dear. I'm just trying to find where's the front. It's loose. Oh, okay. You can turn around anyway. you want. This is oh, the wow. side. Yeah. Mm. You can turn it flattest to the back if you want. And the skirt is on. It fastens at the side. And a slot for a pocket. And unfortunately the velvet shows some marking despite the steaming. A little bit troublesome. Now you can go like that. I will probably get one of those fancy style belt to put on if I was going just like that. Can I put it up? It's a complicated system. It's a little bit too loose I think as well. <laughs> too loose. Hmm. That's very cute. Hmm. Or you can wear what really makes that gown stand out, which is the stole. And this is a purely decorative bit. This is no practical use whatsoever. Just the opposite is detrimental to any practical thing you want to do. Um, it's based on a fashion plate, which doesn't show the back and the description doesn't actually tell you whether the stole continues at the back or not. Um, on second thought, I probably should have gone for symmetrical and do the stone at the back as well. But as it is, I'm just going to tuck it into the waistband and hope for the best. Let's see if I can actually put that on my head. Ta da! So, this is a really iconic sort of aesthetic look. Um, completely useless stole, but looks amazing so much drama with so little i mean it's just a scrap of fabric of some lace that's all it is and the back should be tucked in let me tuck in this guy is quite loose actually mm. again and we're ready for visiting or a promenade let me put something on my head and that's another very sort of arty or bohemian feel to, to the headwear which at that time mostly had big hats, small hats, tocks but this is a soft hat, it's a soft beret with loads of loads of velvet lined in silk and it's regulated as well so you can adjust it so that would be a very unusual style for a woman to wear but a very comfy one, I suppose. But the pattern for this beret is in the Victorian Dressmaker Companion book, Hats, Caps and Bonnets, which is on my website. This dress, um, the pattern and the instructions are coming for the Victorian Dressmaker book number three. At some point in a year or two. Patience is needed. Right, let's put this one on. Ta-da! <laughs> Easy to put on. Does it actually need any hat pins? Let's get some close-ups in a second. So all I need is my little reticule. I used it for my wedding. My gloves. I'll put them in a second. And to make the reconstruction of the fashion plate complete this. Can you zoom in look a bit? If I can remember how to open it. Can I remember how to open it? Yes. 
There you go. Glasses. These are originals and not really perfect for my eyes. Definitely for someone with vision problems. So that would be really useful if you had to read a, I don't know, an invitation to a ball or a card. How fun is this? Mm. So yes, let's go for a walk and visit some friends and see what they think about my new Parisian attire. Thank you very much for watching. Um, if you would like to support me, buy my books, I suppose, <laughs> or just buy me a coffee. The coffee, the buy me a coffee link is in the description. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this one and you've learned something new. I definitely learned a lot while dealing with a world that I'm telling you so. So yes, walk time. Well, here we are in London in Beckham Wright Common with fantastic hysteria here and we're shooting the 1897th um, Paris visiting gown and it's, it's been one of my favourite fashion plates so recreating it was a bit of a treat but at the same time when you look at a fashion plate then it looks fantastic and then you make it and you realise there's a couple of problems with the fashion plate like this toll that is a well, had to be so the whole place. It's just a pain in the arse, really. I mean, I mean, yes, if it's wind, it just flows around. If you attach it to the bottom, which I thought, you still cannot, you know, bend because it goes in the ground. It gets caught in the car doors. <laughs> when you sit down, you sit on it. So sometimes good ideas do not really transcribe very well to the reality, unfortunately. But apart from that, it came up much more wintry than I thought, so I think we will rush it in winter as well as spring. And to be honest, it can be worn without that too. So here we go. Mm. And you cannot twirl without the bloody thing going all over. <laughs> it's like a weapon. <laughs> Let me introduce you to some secrets of working with silk velvet. Um, this is silk on silk velvet and it's quite flimsy, not as flimsy as the viscose and silk, but not as sturdy as um, silk with cotton backing, but still the nightmare to sew. So that's how you deal with it traditionally. You, This is for flat lining, a Victorian skirt. You basically baste diagonally two layers together, two pieces, and then you base those two pieces together and then you stitch and even then the thing moves quite a lot. Um, so it's possible to do it and it has been done like that. But as you know in my books I usually try to show both traditional and modern methods because you know we've advanced since then. So this obviously takes a lot of time and um, frustration and bad language. Now, what I've been experimenting recently is this temporal adhesive, and this works wonders. So basically, I have two pieces I prepared earlier to flatline first. So basically what I do, I just spray, stitch it, well, glue it, do the same on the other one. no bubbles and stuff and this is temporary so even that bond will let go after a few hours but now the proper magic is we need to connect this to inspect it so normally these two will be basted separately and you have to baste these two together and then stitch on a machine now
glued. Nothing is moving. And you stitch normally and then you can finish the seam with whatever, whatever you want. There is a slight um, residue but that again evaporates quite quickly. And there you go, much faster. Much, much faster. <laughs> so the seam was going to be either. You can actually overlock the seams here as well, because once it's glued, it's it doesn't really move much. And these ones can be either finished by pinking or by hand, or overlocked as well. And you have a nice, nice seam. So there you go. A bit of a secret. Thank you.